Um, so this is a Live View native iPhone app, compiling to iPhone. This is a Live View native iPad app. This is one compiling for Mac OS. This is one compiling for Apple Watch. This is one compiling for Vision Pro. Uh, we can't show the Apple TV one because, uh, and I'll get into it later, but the Apple TV simulator um, is currently unsupported in how we're uh, compiling. But we'll, hopefully we'll get that uh, solved in the next few months. But we can actually deploy applications to Apple TV. Um, we just can't use the simulator in Xcode to take a screenshot for my keynote. Uh, <laughs> All right, so um, I, uh, I hope most people at this point now have heard of Live View Native, um, but in case anyone hasn't, I gave a presentation on it last year, which was a set, effectively a uh, proof of concept of a prototype I had worked on, or started rather, about uh, two, two years ago. We hired a SwiftUI dev um, to help kind of get to the point that I could demonstrate it. And um, I gave uh, this slide right here on a kind of synopsis of like what our goals were for the project. And you know, so far, we've been able to hold true to most of these. Um, we're 100% device native um, uh, UI, which means that we are not doing a web render. It's not a web view of live view itself. We are actually uh, creating a native view tree um, in our target clients. And uh, for now, that is still just Swift UI, and I'll get into what's going on with Android in a little bit. Um, so we use all of the native device uh, UI components that are available for the, uh, for the platform frameworks. We want to ensure that if you know how to write live view applications, then other than just the semantics of the differences of like say the view names and how you style them, that you already know how to write live view native applications. And we failed at this one, but I did not want to require any upstream changes to uh, live view Phoenix and I should add Elixir in there, but um, I'll get into uh, that too. So when I presented last year, uh, the demos that we had, we had like very rud rudimentary ElixirConf chat application, but we had at the time covered probably less than 5% of SwiftUI's uh, Surface API. Now we're at 99%. Um, thank you. So it's 99%, not 100%, because there are simply some SwiftUI uh, components and modifiers that don't make sense in a server-side rendered environment. It's not because we haven't gotten there yet. Um, we uh, covered pretty much everything that we can in SwiftUI itself. We've covered, I, I put in all SwiftUI modifiers, but I should probably put a little asterisk next to whenever I say 100% on things. I'll make a game time decision to say this. 99% of SwiftUI modifiers, and when I say modifiers, this is how uh, you style SwiftUI applications and you know, they're not exactly the same as CSS uh, styling classes as they go beyond the scope of what CSS does, but um, it's what we use to style, to animate, and to do a few other things in, uh, in SwiftUI. Uh, so I also did a dum-dum during my keynote last year. I made uh, promises on when things would be ready, uh, which is always, whoops, a terrible idea to be doing. Um, so I said we would be uh, cover most of all SwiftUI by end of year, which is 2022, Android Jetpack, 50%, uh, and then a Windows client um, uh, started by end of year. Yeah, none of that happened. Um, <laughs> so the reason for that is because uh, after the conference, um, probably the, the week after, I decided that we were going to start this new project called Live View Native Core. And this effectively put, like, pumped the brakes on the rest of the development. The reason for it is I started thinking about the complexity required to actually build out additional clients. And while we want to definitely at Dockyard provide uh, the big three, which is going to be the Swift UI client, the Jetpack Compose client, which is Android's composable UI framework, and then WinUI uh, 3 client, we really have a system here that anyone can create a client for any type of composable UI uh, uh, platform that they want to. So we want to make that an easier process. 
And uh, in order to have done it last year, you would have had to implement your own morph DOM implementation that covered all the live uh, view semantics um, that don't have anything to do with the target platform that you're building on top of. And you'd also have to, if a Phoenix Channels client did not exist in that ecosystem, you'd have to build one. So we decided to take all these things that were not specific to Swift UI and then pull them out into a core library. Um, that should hopefully allow you to, or anyone that wants to build out their own, uh, like if anybody wanted to create, say, a Unity uh, a Live View Native client in the future, that they'd be able to do so and have most of the work already done, other than just like really covering what it took to hook Unity's, if Unity has a composable UI framework, uh, for example, into, um, uh, into Live View Native. And we did it uh, building it in Rust. This allows us to create an FFI bridge uh, over to the target platforms. Um, we did it in Rust for a couple of reasons. We had a decent amount of uh, Rust expertise internally at Dockyard, that being the, uh, the Lumen slash uh, Firefly team, which we uh, kind of tore apart uh, for spare parts and <laughs> to, uh, to bring into Live View Native. Um, I am dead set on getting uh, a WASM compiler for uh, uh, the beam uh, done, but we only have so many resources we could point in one direction at a time. Um, so that's been kind of put on the back burner for now. Um, but this allows us to, um, uh, uh, this has been a huge undertaking to get it done in Rust um, in order to create a, uh, what, it, what we've essentially broken it out into two, uh, sorry, I don't have my preview slides here, so I can't see what's next. Um, so uh, let me just go to the next slide right here. All right, so we have the Live View Native core uh, Rust library, and then we have Phoenix Channels client library. And Phoenix Channels client is currently under heavy development. This allows us to uh, break away from the uh, Phoenix Channels implementation that is currently done in Swift. And then there's another one that, that's done in Kotlin that we've been using for the Jetpack client. Um, those have been excellent libraries, and they've definitely done a lot to uh, enable us to build out LiveView Native. Uh, Daniel Reese is the maintainer of those libraries, and he's been super helpful. Um, but the, the issue there is that we'd have to depend upon the availability of such a client in every single target platform that we want to build out in the future. Um, in addition to that, certain things just haven't been there yet. Uh, I don't know if everyone's aware, but when LiveView was created, it actually uh, coerced channels to uh, uh, make some changes. These changes weren't present in the non-Elixir implementations of channels until we discovered that and we had to ask for it and we got them into some of them. Uh, but there's other things that just aren't there yet, like streaming. Um, so these are being done in a single library that whenever changes happen upstream in LiveView itself, we're gonna have one choke point that we can actually make those changes in. We can uh, uh, make bug fixes, make feature changes to align with what LiveView has been doing, and then release it, and then all the clients that are depending upon it will have the advantage of being able to take advantage of that. Everything outside of channels that is still, let's say, the responsibility of LiveView's JS uh, client, um, is packed into Live View Native Core. So this is going to be the morph DOM implementation, uh, the parsing of the, uh, the documents, the uh, patching of the diffs into the documents, the um, certain things that we're finding that are going to be common functionality that we're going to want um, in many different clients. So for example, when we are doing something basic like authentication with a Live View programming model and our our desire to try to stay in that lane as much as possible, how are we storing data on the client to persist when we close our background application, we reopen it so that we can retrieve it and restore, say, authentication state or some other type of state that we need um, uh, when the application has kind of come out of memory. So one idea we're gonna be packing into Live View Native Core is kind of like a, um, a local storage, just like a key value store. Uh, so that you can use something equivalent to JS commands and actually send data over the wire, store it temporarily or long-term in, uh, in a data store that's managed by LiveView Native Core itself and then accessible to the, uh, to the target uh, client platforms. 
Um, so, whoa, LiveView Native Core is already being used in uh, the SwiftUI client, but it's under heavy development. Phoenix Channels client is not yet being used. We're still depending upon the Swift UI, uh, sorry, the Swift implementation of channels, but we're probably, I don't wanna make promises, we're getting close. Um, so where is the Android client? Um, this has all been, this is one of the more common questions I get asked other than offline mode. Um, what I keep saying is soon, we will have an Android client soon. Uh, the kind of story behind that is um, that we are, uh, uh, we have a full-time developer working on it right now, but he only started about a month and a half ago. Um, we have gone through a few other developers, but when we decided that we were gonna try to extract all this common functionality out into LiveView Native Core, we essentially had two clients that are being developed in parallel, the SwiftUI client and the Jetpack Compose client. And I saw enough like deviations that were occurring and it was real difficult for me to kind of like wrap my head around, you know, one moving one direction versus the other. So we're kind of using the Swift UI client to establish as many conventions as possible that we're going to create a roadmap and essentially just a checklist that future clients that they should be doing X, Y, and Z or one, two, three, four, all the way to the numbers um, in order to kind of conform to the way that we believe that Live View Native clients should work. But in addition to that, um, how they interact with, um, with Core itself. So let's go over the anatomy of the SwiftUI uh, project because as people start to use this and they wanna dig in and find out where things are, we've done things a bit atypical, but I think uh, our explanation will make sense. So this is the Swift, uh, LiveView Native uh, SwiftUI uh, repo. And what we've done is actually bake in the, uh, the Swift uh, client and the Elixir code side by side. They used to be in two separate repos. But what we found was happening was that the coupling between the server side and the, the client side was so tight that issues being opened in one weren't being responded to in the other. It was just a lot of mixed messaging. So putting everything in the same repo made a lot of operational sense to us. Um, and it works out well because thankfully neither Swift UI projects or, or sorry, Swift projects and Elixir projects use the same names for things. Um, so if that were to happen in a future client, we'll probably have to come up with a new convention there. But the orange arrows indicate um, that, like most of the important directories for, uh, for the Swift side of things. And then the blue or purple arrows are gonna be where the Elixir stuff lives. Inside the sources directory, there's a live view native directory. And inside there, there's a views directory. And the views directory is where we have organizationally put all of our Swift UI view implementations. Um, this is going to uh, hopefully match up with the uh, directory, sorry, the hierarchy uh, that is actually present in the Swift UI documentation itself. Um, one thing that's really important to me uh, is that we are not kind of cowboy coding off in a direction and just, re just implementing something that we now have to support as a deviation from, from the norm. So we've, been, we've done that at times and we've had the course correct back uh, I think that's always for the better because there's a lot of uh, existing uh, documentation and knowledge out there. And if we're just kind of going off and doing something different, then we have to support all that. Um, but in this instance, it, in this instance, the image uh, Swift UI view is under the images category along with async image. And we're gonna find, you know, as you would expect, image to be under the images uh, directory in the Swift UI uh, repo itself. Um, even though we, wanted to, we want to be able to point people at the SwiftUI documentation, there is enough of you know, kind of things that we need that are gonna deviate at times, or at least be our way of doing things, that we have our own uh, documentation for SwiftUI, um, the SwiftUI uh, uh, views in LiveView Native. And so if you wanted to memorize that URL right there, have at it, but I'm not gonna put it up very long. Instead, you can go to the uh, LiveView Native uh, uh, repo the, sorry, the SwiftUI Live View Native repo, and just click on the documentation link. That's gonna be a lot easier for you to peruse. There's a lot of really good stuff in there, guides and uh, details. But um, to get to this thing that I say that we did not adhere to, um, and why we did not adhere to these things. So when we were, when we were originally exploring Live View Native, it seemed like we could be at this point where we did not need to really kind of poke the bear on Phoenix Core to uh, request upstream changes of things. 
But as we've gotten into like the nitty gritty on building out LiveView Native, um, you know, the obvious statement is that we're not building HTML and we're not building web, we're building native. Um, so there are just some things that we would either have to compromise on or that we wouldn't simply be able to do uh, uh, from uh, things that make sense to do in Phoenix on the web in HTML, but don't make sense for our purposes. So for example, uh, naming conventions. Originally, we had this kind of convention that if on the Swift UI side, on the right-hand side, um, you know, everything was camel cased, then it was gonna be uh, hyphenated case uh, in LiveView Native. So lowercase t text would become uppercase t text, or v dash stack would become v stack, or lazy dash v stack, lazy, lazy dash v dash stack became lazy v stack. And after a period of time, I just got sick of like looking at the hyphenation and I said, all right, we're gonna figure out how to do this. Um, as it turns out, um, the uh, template compiler in uh, LiveView and Phoenix uh, was blocking this because it was doing what it needed to do, which was assuming that any uh, thing that started with a capital letter was a module lookup for component names. So when we tried to do this, it would fail because it can't find a lazy VStack module. Um, after, some, uh, after some talk, I, uh, I may be speaking out of turn, but I think that the actual solution was just to check to see if there was a dot in there now. And so we got that change upstream, and now we actually have uh, some uh, escape hatches in the, uh, in the template compiler that we can, um, on our end, deviate a bit from, from time to time on how um, and get what we need in terms of making our templates adhere closer to what we think LiveView native templates should look like. Another area was uh, template sigils. So the Heeks template sigil here, this would fail because it is going through the regular Phoenix uh, template compiler. Uh, we needed a way to uh, programmatically tell uh, uh, Phoenix like, oh, we wanna use our template compiler instead. So our kind of stopgap solution was to use a Z. No one else had claimed that yet. Uh, but then we were like, oh, there's probably gonna be some areas that we wanna do something different for Jetpack than Swift UI. We don't wanna just like paint ourselves in a corner and have just one template sigil for everything. And template sigils supported this modifier syntax where you just stuck a little uh, uh, string at the end. Um, and uh, Jose is like, yeah, don't do that. So. <laughs> So uh, this kind of convinced him to add multi-character sigils into Elixir, which I believe was 115, um, somewhere around then. So now we have this nice Swift UI uh, multi-character sigil. We still have this kind of base one of LVN, LVN for LiveView Native, and then the modifier that comes at the end of the, uh, the document string is the um, platform ID. But this is really the one that you'd be using. Um, so Jetpack Compose will be Jetpack, and then WinUI 3 will be WinUI 3, or just maybe WinUI. The, uh, uh, the thing that we're trying to stick to as well is imposing naming conventions across everything, and this is something that I think we just started doing maybe in the past three months. We had kind of a mishmash, especially with the way SwiftUI is named. There's some that SwiftUI, one word, there's some that Swift underscore UI. Uh, so in Apple's own documentation um, and uh, coding, it refers to a SwiftUI as one word. Uh, even with you know, the capitalization. So we've normalized upon that. If anyone's going through documentation, uh, any type of uh, material or the source code, and they see a Swift underscore UI, um, I would consider that a bug. Please submit it as a bug or a PR to, to, to fix it. I think we may have one um, uh, Elixir repo that still has the underscore UI on it. And I think that's only there because of Elixir's kind of uh, uh, enforcement on the, uh, the camel casing, sorry, the, the underscore snake casing to camel casing convention. Uh, next is modifiers. Uh, modifiers were the bane of my existence and kind of the, uh, the big, uh, I'd say, time suck on, on the team. Because on one hand, we were really hoping going into this naively that we were gonna have something this simple, right? We were just gonna have like a flat, uh, one-dimensional uh, way to style our elements, and they would just be key value pairs on the element names themselves. But uh, SwiftUI modifiers are incredibly complex, super powerful, but very, very complex. So this is not a legitimate uh, modifier 
um, uh, call the second one. But the syntax is what's more important here. So we have a tech, this is the like SwiftUI code here. So we're passing hello ElixirConf to create a new text view, and then we're setting the font size to 12, and we're setting the color to black. The problem is that modifiers can take views as arguments. And that's the equivalent of CSS rules taking HTML as a value. And then having that HTML having inline CSS that then can take more HTML as a value and so on and so on. It, it, it's not something that you can really reasonably represent in a one dimensional fashion. And something that we really struggled with to come up with something that didn't suck. Um, so like here's a pretty trivial example, but and yes, there's the, so that's the view that is inside the background modifier, and the background modifier is modifying the text element. Text view, rather. But this is also, uh, I don't know if it's actually legit code, but like something like this could be happening at some level within SwiftUI where you have these like heavily nested um, uh, SwiftUI uh, modifiers, views, modifiers, views, modifiers, views. Probably not practical to do that, just that we have to be able to support nested modifiers. So when this became apparent, um, one of the things that we first did was like, okay, let's just make it work. So we came up with this modifiers attribute on the element names and um, what this required us to do, whereas with the uh, SwiftUI views, we did not have to actually write like live view components um, for everything. And that would have been a ton of work, having to write every single live view component and re-implement all the logic, then all the, uh, uh, like all the testing on the Elixir side, and then have it map over on the SwiftUI client. But because of the way the modifiers work, we did have to do that work on the, um, on the Elixir side. And I say we, but I really mean May. May did all that work. Um, so the way that this, this uh, I think actually Anil maybe came up with one of the first uh, uh, com concepts on this. And then May did a lot of the, uh, the implementation side on the Elixir side of things, and, then, and as did Carson. So here we have kind of the same, um, like this is like the live view native re-implementation of this right here. Um, so what's happening is that we have this at native um, that gets passed into your templates. This has some metadata in it, but we need something to pass into the modifier functions in order to pipe. So the, the modifiers that, because we're chaining them in SwiftUI, we can pipe uh, the modifiers in LiveView Native. Uh, and we declare a template within the text itself, and then we just link the two. So if you see that BG content on the, uh, the top, and that's linked down to the template name, uh, BG content uh, towards the bottom. But, I mean, this is verbose, and uh, my eyes were bleeding looking at it all the time. So uh, we were able to, through the compile, template compiler itself, our, you know, our escape hatches, we were able to kind of mix out the requiring the at native. It, during the compilation stage, it gets stuck back in there, but just so that you're not always having to repeat it. This is also, this is better, but not ideal. So, what I can say is that I think we've come up with a significantly better solution. And I say we, but I again mean May, came up with a much better solution. Uh, so uh, she one day dropped in our channel and said, hey, I did something. And um, this concept of mod classes. And they uh, look very similar to CSS classes, right? In your templates, you just give it a name. And then in your uh, contextually, um, uh, the, the, the module that's contextually relevant to the template that's currently being rendered, you define a mod class function. It, first argument is always the native object. And then the second arg uh, argument is going to be the style name, or rather the class name that it is matching against. And mod classes can take m any number of, of names. They're just gonna be separated by, by white space, just like CSS, so we split. And then based upon the order, we're gonna be piping the result of one function into another. So here, uh, rather than having all of that uh, styling um, and modifier work in your template itself, it is now in, programmatically in the code. So um, we are matching on the leading star 
uh, uh, mod class value, and we get the native object. We pipe it into the background modifier. It is going to be linked back to the star template, back in the original template itself, and then um, the color red for the star template. So if anyone's already thinking ahead, you'll probably maybe guess as to what my next slide is going to be, that we can use the power of Elixir to really uh, improve this significantly. So uh, mod classes allow us, well, sorry, we don't allow it. Uh, Jose has allowed us to actually do uh, pattern matching on function signatures, and we can use binary uh, uh, string matching, and we can create significantly more flexible and uh, powerful uh, styling functions. This actually puts us on the path towards a like feature full styling framework that we can build out in the future. And just to kind of like uh, demonstrate this in um, uh, in action, this is when May kind of told us about this. This is what she put in the in the uh, in the channel that day. So she's showing in real time that you know making these basic styling updates, and she's able to make very fast, very quick uh, style changes to a native application uh, that's being built out. And there are the functions that it's matching against. So this is incredibly powerful and something that I think is going to, um, uh, we still have, I think there's some rough spots. We got to figure out animations and there may be one or two areas. Um, if anyone's wondering why we didn't just call it class, uh, the, the two reasons right now are one kind of subjective and the other objective. Uh, the subjective reason is we didn't want to conflate like CSS classes directly with this because the um, responsibility of modifiers is significantly more complex than CSS. Uh, but the second one is, again, the limits of the template compiler on FAMX or how we're being limited by it at the moment. Um, there are, uh, uh, we would need the ability to do some uh, on the fly, like attribute um, replacement during at compile time of the template to, to just move it over to class entirely. The, um, uh, and so I just uh, gave Chris the bad news yesterday that we're gonna be kind of deviating from the Phoenix template engine for the time being. My, my, hope is that we come back to it at some point in the future after we've sussed out everything that we want, everything that we need. It's just that the, the turnaround time right now and constantly having to like debate over the merits of what we're asking for is really, really time consuming. It slows down our progress. So um, we're just going to be um, a kind of bring in our own version of the template, uh, sorry, the Phoenix template engine, the ability to um, uh, really kind of uh, iterate on that very quickly. And then maybe within a year or so, we'll be able to come back and say, you know, if we can agree upon these escape hatches, um, we can uh, you know, remove our need for this deviation on the template engine and then uh, uh, come to a, you know, come back home to, the, to Phoenix. But it's, it's unfortunately necessary just because um, we don't want to burden the Phoenix core team with all these like one-off type questions and asks. And we need, you know, Sometimes they give us really good and valuable pushback, but it's quicker for us to kind of explore and see the failure rather than having to go through the process of talking about it sometimes. Um, so that's our, that's our reasoning, at least for now. So in addition to that, I've actually asked Adam of Tailwind, the CEO, if we can just straight up steal like the, the CSS class names for what will hopefully eventually be a whole styling framework for LiveView Native um, that will in hopefully in most cases, be able to leverage like the knowledge on, on uh, um, you know, if you're performant at writing Tailwind uh, styling, then you should be able to, without having to go through like Apple Swift UI documentation isn't always great at times. I have trouble finding where things are, but if I know that a particular uh, Tailwind uh, style exists, then maybe we can actually crib off that for a live view native styling framework. In addition to that, what's really cool is, um, if I go back here for a moment, the native uh, uh, um, variable being passed in has metadata on what the platform is. So inside it, it's just a struct, and it's going to have information saying that this is for Swift UI, and this is, uh, let's say, a watch OS target. So we're going to be able to pattern match on that struct to actually build out what may be a singular styling framework that can be shared between uh, Swift UI, Jetpack Compose, and WinUI 3. But be able to actually spit out the necessary um, uh, like 
in Swift UI, the modifiers in other frameworks will be something different. But the point is, is that we're going to have a kind of like common language in the template itself. And uh, hopefully, most of the engineers won't even need to like get down to that nitty gritty of looking up for modifiers or other like styling kind of nuances in the individual frameworks. Uh, another thing that we've worked on are add-ons. So the um, Swift UI client starts and stops what the surface area of Swift UI is itself. That's it. Um, and Swift UI uh, doesn't have a way to manage forms and form data the same way that it does on the web. And this is something that we need. So the uh, Lexicon chat application from last year and the one that we've deployed this year, uh, it has you know, input elements and submit buttons and all that. But um, when we're building out server-side uh, uh, applications, we can't do programmatically from the live view programming model what we would need to do building out traditional Swift UI applications. And the way the Swift UI works is that when you, you assign an event to a button, and then in the code, you then go and pick and choose. Like you have to code out and say, I want the value from this input element. I want the value from that input element. And you have to decide how you're going to serialize that data and send it up to a server. Um, that's not something that we can really do uh, from the server side aspect of writing applications. So, uh, but we did not want to add that into SwiftUI itself because that functionality does not exist in SwiftUI, but it's a necessary one for building out apps. So we have this add-on library called LiveView Native Live Form. And what it's going to do is exactly what you would expect on a web form. It's going, when you uh, use a PHX uh, submit event um, on a button, it's going to take all the child elements of the parent's form elements. In this case, it would be a live form element. And it would serialize that and send it off to the server. So you should have a very similar experience to how you're building out forms for HTML as you would for Live View Native. And the next one here, before I get into it, you'll notice that the name of this project has SwiftUI in it, but the previous one does not. The reason for that is because we're starting to think about how, what the scope of add-ons would be. And we have kind of two classes of add-ons. We have platform-specific add-ons, and we have platform-agnostic add-ons. So a platform-agnostic add-on has the ability to actually register itself, or sorry, it would have the um, kind of uh, uh, the repo structure in the expectation that this is going to host similar code and similar developer experience across multiple platforms. So right now, we just have the Swift UI one, but um, we will be adding a Jetpack uh, Compose uh, directory to that add-on, and then a similar live form uh, with the same API for Jetpack, because Jetpack has the same limitation. It does not have the concept of a form that serializes through a submit button as you do on the web. But Understandably, MapKit does not exist outside of Swift, or outside of Apple's ecosystem. Um, so we've started to build add-ons for the incredibly large and a uh, bit overwhelming ecosystem of Apple. Uh, these are the ones we started right now. I think we have an AV Kit one as well. That's pretty basic at the moment. Um, the Swift UI MapKit library, I believe, requires the beta of uh, Swift UI which is going to be released, what, in like a few weeks when the new operating systems drop. The reason for that is that um, the new version of, of MapKit has actual Swift UI views in it, whereas up until now, it did not. We could have done kind of like a best guess on it or you know, try to hack something together. But I'd, I mean, it's only a few weeks away, so I'd rather target for what's coming out in just a few weeks and then be able to take advantage and, you know, keep things kind of in line with the way that Apple is actually doing it. Uh, SwiftUI Charts, thankfully, is um, uh, already built for SwiftUI. And um, these libraries are uh, probably pretty buggy at the moment. We just, two or three weeks ago, kind of made a big change in LiveView Native where um, we had kind of like a, uh, um, I'll say like a disagreement on what the role of the project was. And ultimately, I kind of ruled in the favor of saying that LiveView Native is meant for LiveView Elixir engineers, not native engineers that want to build in LiveView. And so uh, we had some uh, 
I'd say really nice functionality that we ended up pulling out because it just wasn't things, these weren't things that existed in Live View itself. They were, they made more sense from the programmatic perspective of building for native rather than the programmatic perspective of building for Live View. So if you think like client side building experience as opposed to a server side building experience. Um, and the, uh, the map kit and the charts library, I believe were implemented prior to that decision. And we're still waiting for you know, some stability there. I think maybe some fixes were made, but um, we'll, we'll uh, get back to those add-ons um, probably in the next few weeks. Uh, so add-ons themselves allow us to package up custom server-side functionality for Live View Native, allow us to package up custom client-side functionality for Live View Native, and um, Next, I want to move over to how you can get started with Live View Native, because this has kind of been a, uh, a sore spot as well. We, we've been moving really fast, and you know, things have been breaking, but um, now we are uh, at a spot that we're starting to look at cre uh, creating st some stability. So one of the biggest kind of pain points people have had is that they've gone to the repo, and this is really our fault because we haven't removed it yet, and they look at this and they go to the tutorial and they do like the cats live view native uh, demo. That demo, or sorry, that tutorial is really nice. Anil built it, um, I believe, for the last Elixir Conf, and we haven't really updated it since. The um, uh, and so understandably, there's just things that just break in it all the time. People get confused, upset, you know. And so, I think it took me longer to take a screenshot and put that arrow in than it would have taken me to just remove the, the text from that readme itself. <laughs> but I'm just realizing that right now. Someone, uh, some PRs are welcome. Um, yeah, don't, don't use that. Um, so instead, uh, May has um, uh, put together guides that are available on Hex Docs now. So if you go to Hex Docs and you go to the Live View Native uh, uh, package up there and you go on Guides, um, this will step you through hopefully everything that you're going to need to just get going. Um, with one caveat that I discovered last night, and I'm going to call that out uh, right now. So when you finally get past the installation instructions and you get to your first live view, uh, your first native live view, um, I believe that current versions of Phoenix will generate a, uh, this particular line as, I think, like, in this case, this is called my app web, right? So I believe it comes up as my app web, comma, live, underscore view. Uh, that needs to be reverted to use phoenix.liveview for now. And the reason for that is the other form uh, has all the macros and ends up wrapping the responses with, um, with layouts. And the layouts at the, at the time are still going to be wrapping in HTML, and then the client doesn't know what to do, and it just does nothing. Um, we are going to be incorporating layouts into Live View Native. Um, uh, this is actually a, uh, this is going to be a breaking change that um, we're going to be imposing because currently uh, Live View Native, what it does is for like say navigation. So um, we used to have a configuration option in, in the Swift UI, uh, sorry, in the Swift code where you would have to enable navigation. And what it would do is when you enabled it, it would take all of the Live View Native templates and just wrap them in a navigation stack, which is a uh, Swift UI uh, uh, component. And it's like, why don't we just enable that by default? And so that's now enabled by, by default. We always, you know, there's probably rarely an opportunity when you're not going to need navigation. But then it dawned upon me, like, why don't we just get rid of that as an option and make it more uh, explicit and move it into the layouts? So I think right now, even though we've been doing most of the template rendering inside the rendering functions, I believe we actually do support the ability to do like, um, uh, like live name, like the name of the, the live view function or the, the module dot, say, swiftui.watchos.heeks. And we can um, uh, appropriately target the right uh, template. But I don't think that extends to, to layouts right now. Um, and so we will be hopefully getting that in. And then if you want navigation, you would have to explicitly like, put the nav stack, um, the navigation stack uh, element, and then um, inside it do the inner content as you normally would do. Um, but after that, you should be able to get a Live View Native application up and running uh, pretty easily. And along with this, uh, we've released Live View Native uh, version 0.1.0 which I am going to call a not production ready uh, version of it. Um, 
we are, uh, uh, we've been like really focused on covering the surface area, surface API of SwiftUI, um, and now we're kind of pulling back uh, the direction I've given the team that for the rest of the year, we're gonna be focused on bug squashing, performance improvement, um, and uh, really everything that's listed in this app, sorry, this list. So as we're moving towards version 0.2, these are the things that I think will be required for us to call a 0.2. Uh, we're gonna need a, maybe production ready. Uh, we're gonna need the Jetpack client, not ready, but at least out so people can use it. Uh, this is one of the really more common cited reasons why people will want to use LiveView Native for good reasons. They, they don't wanna have to go and build a separate Android uh, application in Jetpack, Compose, or whatever framework they wanna do outside of this. Um, we need to increase the compilation target. So for example, um, the TVOS, uh, uh, thing that I showed earlier on. The reason for that is the simulator currently does not uh, compile. We can't compile, rather, for the uh, Xcode simulator for tvOS. And this is a limitation in Rust itself. Um, I uh, went through the kind of unfortunate experience of having to interact with the Rust core team to get things done, and it's a really lengthy and time-consuming process. Uh, we did that to get tvOS compilation in, but the simulator was not included in that scope. So what's really weird is that we can compile for Vision Pro, but we can't compile for uh, the tvOS simulator. Um, but uh, the expectation of everyone developing for LiveView Native is that they're gonna wanna run the simulator. And when it doesn't work, you know, that increases, I like to call the WTFs per minute, and uh, we wanna keep that low. Um, anytime that anyone finds that we're deviating from what a live view convention would be, I would highly suggest you to open it as a bug. I would consider it a bug. Uh, we need to stay in the live view uh, like lane as much as possible. Sometimes it doesn't always make sense, but at the very least, we're gonna do a best effort to try to uh, course correct when we can. In cases where we've deviated from it, it, there may be good reason for doing so. It also may be because we were blocked on something. We just needed something in there to continue, all, continue on something on what we were working on. Um, and then we uh, just lost sight of that kind of temporary fix. So if anyone runs into anything and they're saying, oh, that's not how it's done in Live View, then you know, open an issue. Uh, we're squashing runtime bugs. This will hopefully become less of a thing as we get the Phoenix Channels client uh, uh, done and into core and then integrated, or maybe it'll become more of a thing. Maybe we'll get more bugs, I don't know. I hope we have less bugs, but at least we'll have more direct control over these things and we'll be able to, to fix. Um, but uh, we uh, were focused on um, you know, going through and trying to surface these things. But in order to surface them, we need use cases. So we need people to start using it. We can only build so many like, rudimentary applications that I can tweet about. Um, we want to improve our onboarding experience. So May has addressed this, I say, in part. Uh, when you go through those guides on the hex docs, you're going to see this, this mix task now, mix lvn.install and we'll kind of just, uh, 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 just bootstrap your application for Live View Native. And then we really need to uh, improve our educational content. And when I say improve, I mean create educational content. Um, so to that end, um, uh, I invited Brooklyn uh, Myers onto the Live View Native core team to kind of head up that effort. So uh, Brooklyn has been uh, fantastic, building up Docker Academy. Um, he's just finished his second cohort. We're gonna defer the third cohort for now for probably just the, the rest of the year. Um, and he's gonna focus on uh, you know, really going through all the documentation, make sure everything's aligned, um, building up guides, writing blog posts. Um, and then we actually have a live book for LiveView Native as well, which will instantiate a Phoenix uh, a LiveView application, and then you can point uh, Xcode simulator at it and write your own uh, uh, Live View Native templates in there. It's actually probably needs to be significantly updated because um, I wrote a prototype of it a few months ago and then uh, someone was able to get uh, some extra things working on it, but we've kind of shelved it. We'll get it updated and then what I'm really hoping is that we end up with a live book type educational tool in the same way that Docker Academy is. So offline mode, this is, uh, other than the Android client, this is one of the more common questions that we get. And um, out of the box, LiveView Native does not have offline mode support. And it makes sense because it is a server-side rendered framework. But 
Uh, after the uh, keynote last year, um, the drinks that evening, Garth Hitchens pulled me aside and he's like, I got an idea. So uh, he told me about, you know, he's been using Electro Desktop for a while. And I, I've heard of it, I hadn't really played with it. And he's like, you could probably do something with Electro Desktop and Live Native. And I had like five drinks in me at the time. I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> and then later that night, I was like, oh, yeah, he's right. We can do that. Um, we haven't tried it yet. Uh, just that the, the potential for doing this is there. And like the way I kind of think of it working is that uh, we would, you would write your Phoenix applications as normal. You compile them with Electro Desktop. They would run on device. So you have live view native templates being sort of locally on device to, um, you know, in the application that you're using. And then the Elixir desktop live view native application essentially acts as a node in an Erlang cluster, right? So when the network goes down or, is, uh, or is, there's high latency, then it's not going to be synchronizing uh, with the, the, you know, the external uh, uh, source of truth of data, but you can still write stuff locally. So you're not gonna have that experience of being offline, you're not gonna go down. Um, and then when network comes back, then whatever your strategy is for data synchronization, whether it's a CRDT or whatever you want to use, is how you would just get that uh, data in sync. Um, I think this would be really nice. And the actually other cool part is that compared to something like React Native, still compiling Elixir and Phoenix and all that uh, comes in at like 10 to 15 megabytes less than a um, like Hello World React Native application. So here's some examples that we've done. For those that haven't downloaded it yet, we've created another ElixConf chat application. Uh, this time we have it available for iPad, Mac OS, and for iPhone. Um, everyone, well, mostly everyone should be on it. You just enter in your email address, you get a code. I, Jim mentioned that some people had tickets purchased from them for them under a different email address. If that's the case you want to get in, just let me know and we'll get the email address updated. Uh, Carson created a, uh, a chess app um, in LiveView Native. And uh, he proposed it, and I was like, no, there's not enough time to do that. He's like, well, I just did it. <laughs> so it, was, it was already done. Um, and then Paulo was like, oh, yeah, we can add an NX like, machine learning player into it. So you can do that. You can play, like, when you create a new, uh, when you start the application, you can actually, in the upper right hand corner, it has like a little plus symbol. You start a new game, and then you can choose to play against NX. And as multiple people have pointed out, NX is not very good at playing chess. Um, <laughs> and the reason for that is simply because we have it deployed on, deployed on fly. We don't have a lot of resources. Like, there's no GPU that we're utilizing. So it's kind of like a low power um, machine learning solution, but it makes all the right moves. It makes, like, probably beat like a 10 year old, but. Um, you can feel good about yourself for beating uh, NX in chess. You can play against other people, and you can watch other games. Um, uh, so if, uh, if anyone's inclined to, these are open source apps. Um, we have the ElixirConf chat app, which is from this year. We have the chess app uh, from this year. You can go in and play with them or get them stood up. Uh, there's a native directory in each one that has the, uh, the live native code. If anyone feels compelled to add a feature and wants to PR before the conference is over. And if we think that it's okay, we'll merge it in, we'll deploy it. And so that it's available for other people to see. Like one thing that we're missing from the chat app is a list of the attendees in a given room. That would be a pretty low hanging fruit thing to do. Also adding the current count of attendees in the hallway uh, would be nice. Um, so uh, here's, a, here's like a, uh, a question that I get from time to time, like, is it better to use LiveView Native than something else? And like, to me, this is a very subjective question. I can't really answer it. I think it's better to use, but you know, for those that already know Swift UI or using Flutter or using React Native, is it better for them to use? I don't know. Um, I think a better question for us to ask is, is it cheaper to use LiveView Native? So uh, this has been kind of like the reason why I pursued this project, because I'm, I'm convinced after seeing the benefits um, of LiveView over single page application frameworks or more traditionally like server rendered applications, like LiveView is just requires less time to build similar apps. And this is important for a software consultancy like Dockyard that's competing on cost, but it's also important for companies that are being mindful of cost. So what we did to test this is we took a non-trivial uh, application idea. 
and we shopped it out to a few consultancies. We, uh, we requested that they um, provide us like responses and dev hours because the, the cost wasn't really you know, going to be comparable because everyone has different rates. Um, but we paid for the estimation, so we didn't just like, get free work from people. Um, but we also ensured that the shops we were shopping with the shops we were uh, sending the, um, the scope of work out to had a variety of tech stacks so we can make a fair uh, comparison. What we found was that most of the estimations that came in were roughly within, let's say, 5% of one another. So this gave us some confidence that they were pretty accurate. And the live view native estimation, which we ran internally, was greater than 40% less than all of them. It's a huge, huge cost savings. And this comes out in just pure dev hours. And this is gonna get even higher when we start talking about adding other platforms into the mix. All right, so um, that's my keynote. I wanna thank the team behind uh, Live View Native. Uh, Carson, who's over here. Uh, May and Elle, who are not here. Brooklyn is right over there. Nelson is not here. Um, and then, of course, former team members who we would not have been able to accomplish what we've accomplished without them. Uh, Anil, who unfortunately Apple stole from us uh, during the summer. Um, uh, Thomas, who was on the project on the Rust Core team and actually just finished up with us this past Friday. And then Paul, who I cannot seem to keep employed at Dockyard for more than one year at a time. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I just want to also say that this, all like the projects like this, and for those that were in the, uh, uh, the previous um, presentation that Leandro gave on Beacon CMS are all possible through Dockyard R&D. Um, Live View Native thus far, like our total investment is, is probably in the vicinity of about $1 million. We haven't seen one penny come back on that just yet. Um, we, we invest, we'll reinvest about 10% of our revenue, not profit, revenue into R&D, because we, we believe in Elixir, we want to expand its utility. And if you want to contribute to these projects, you know, one of the ways to do that is hiring Docker, because we're going to put that money back into the Elixir ecosystem. Um, and if you want to be an early adopter of Live View Native, hire Dockyard. Uh, we're, we're confident, well, we're not, you know, sell, like trying to convince people to go out and try to build it themselves just yet, at least for production use. We have, you know, the people that build it internally, and so we're confident that we can, like, we can build the production level applications live view native and make them uh, pretty hardened. But hopefully in the next few months, we'll be able to get the project to the point where everyone can enjoy that. Thank you. <laughs>